Well, if you'll please open your Bibles to the book of 2 John, which is, excuse me, 3 John, which is just before Jude, just before Revelation. 3 John, it's after 1 and 2 John, towards the end of your Bible. And the ushers are nearby, so if you need a Bible, if you'll just please raise your hand up in the air, they will be more than happy to give you a Bible. Last week, one of them thought he was at a ball game and was throwing peanuts. And uh, the guy caught it, too. But uh, no, I'm kidding. Third John, let's stand together, please, and let me read to you. Beautiful little epistle, packed. He says in verse 1, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved... I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive or support such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church." Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness of it, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father, we want to greet you this morning, as we already have throughout the time that we've been awake. Thank you that while we were asleep, you were not. You were watching over us, and you knew what we would think before we even awoke. You know when our feet hit the floor, we are the object of your love and of your joy. We are the apple of your eye. You care more for us than we could really begin to fully appreciate. We thank you for the word of God, which helps us, Lord, to understand who is God, who is Jesus. And who am I as a person? And what is it that you want to do in my life? And what do you want me to do with my life for you and for others? We thank you also, Lord, for the Holy Spirit of God. And we invite his ministry now throughout the facility in the lives of the youth out in the youth chapel and the children here at Calvary Chapel along with our ushers, those who are cleaning up, our security, and every person who's on this campus this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Just a few questions to consider before we get into the text. One of those would be, if you were to put in a sentence or two How would you describe yourself right now in your life? Or how would you describe what you would like to become? 
And how do you think other people would describe you? What, if anything, you don't want to have in your life right now? And lastly, what is it you would like to have in your life right now? In this epistle, what John does, the aged apostle in his late 90s, or somewhere in his 90s is late, whether you're 91 or 99. Thank you for that response. (laughs) I'll note that each time you do, uh, which won't be very often, I can assure you of that. But um, he wrote to speak really about three people and then one issue. He speaks to a man named Gaius, whom the issue of the letter is primarily about. He addresses a troublemaker in the church named Diotrephes, and then he mentions in just one sentence a man named Demetrius. And the background to this has to do with this man, Gaius, and this church and their involvement in the support of the furtherance of the gospel beyond their own four walls. It's something that Paul, John says, we ought to imitate. And so he begins by saying, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And if you'll hold your finger there for a moment and then turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, I wanted to just mention briefly that word elder there, is also translated pastor in some places, or bishop, or overseer. They all really refer to the same particular function within the church. And those terms are used interchangeably. But the elder is the principal office holder in a local church, a person who was called and gifted by the Holy Spirit recognized by other elders and qualified according to the standards that you find here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The duties of a pastor, an elder, an overseer include ruling the church, pastoring or shepherding the flock, guarding the truth, and general oversight of the work including finances. And so when John writes, he's writing from a position of uh, authority. Not only was he an elder, but he was one of the apostles, the only one who died of natural causes. But the other thing that I wanted to say about elders in the church is sometimes that term can be a little um, perhaps intimidating to uh, men in particular. And as we have recently launched our men's ministry and had somewhere around 90 men at our first meeting, uh, and then the, quote, elders broke that group up into individual smaller groups. But just to say to you, these men are just ordinary guys. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look among yourselves. There aren't many great, many noble, but we're just common people. The fact is that these men are just like you. They put their shoes on, uh, one at a time, their pants on, they, they are subject to the same challenges you are. The, the, maybe the difference or the similarity as the case may be is that they have grown to a level of maturity within the body. They've demonstrated their giftedness. They've been recognized by others as being qualified to be in this position. And their desire is to really just come alongside of you as an ordinary guy dealing with ordinary men and together serving a extraordinary singular person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who wants to transform all of us from our ordinary life into a spirit-filled, mature, Christian, effective life. So it's really a family matter. And I would encourage all of you men just to recognize these guys, you know, they don't have it all together, just like you don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. The only one here is Pastor Mike. 
Okay, so that's what, at least that's what he told me the other day. And I said, well, if you say so. No, he didn't. But we're all just common people. We're all dealing with the same issues. But nonetheless, there is this position of authority and leadership. And John opens the letter by introducing himself, and he says, the elder. And he was so loved. He was, in fact, he even stated in the Gospel of John, which he wrote, he said, I'm the one that Jesus loved. And it shows his imperfectness. He had to kind of throw that in there, you know. I don't know if you know the whole story behind that, but someday you might. And then he introduces us to the first person he's writing to, the main person here. He says, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. That word truth is mentioned six times in the 14 verses in this brief letter. He says, I love you. He says, you're beloved, and I, and I love you in truth. And then he calls him beloved again in verse 2, and he, he begins to pray for him now in three different ways. He says, I pray first of all that you may prosper, just a general uh, term that you, may, that you might just prosper um, in every part of your life, just that you might do well. And then secondly, he actually says, I, I pray that you may prosper in all things, in all of the things that you're doing. And he's going to really focus in on one of the main things that this guy did in a few moments. But in everything you're doing, I pray that you may prosper. And, you know, you can pray that same prayer for yourself. You can say, Lord, I'm asking that you might prosper me in my life. Secondly, he prayed that he would be in good health. It's quite possible that Gaius was not in good health, or it may be that John was just affirming, hey, I hope you will continue to be in good health. We really don't know, but it's just as valid to pray for your physical well-being as it is to pray for any other part of your life. We all have to deal with our physical um, matters, especially and I, I'm told this, I don't know it personally, but I'm told that I read a lot of books about older people, and uh, that's why I'm mentioning it to you. <laughs> you see, I told you earlier. And then thirdly, he says, and this is now the, the kind of measure, it's not necessarily a prayer, it's more an affirmation and a, a kind of a measuring stick for the first and possibly more the second part of his prayer, he says, just as your soul prospers. So he really had that as the primary thing that was important to him, just as your soul prospers. So I'm praying that you just prosper, and I'm praying that you are in good health. You can pray those things. And then I would ask you this question today. In that description of yourself, if you've thought it through, would you be able to say, you know, today my soul is prospering in the Lord or it's beginning to prosper or it used to, but I'm trying to get it prospering again or I desire to have a prosperous relationship with God. This man had one. You could be not prospering in everything. You could be in poor health and yet your soul could be prospering. Paul the Apostle wrote a number of his epistles from a Roman prison, not three squares and air conditioning and heating and a little bunk and medical care and all of that exercise yard, but down in a deep stone, cold, dank pit with a hole in the floor. And he had what is possibly believed to be what's called the Mediterranean disease where his eyes would... would haven't heard that on this roof for a long time. One night we had a, an outreach here at night, and boy, it came down. We had that famous uh, violinist was here. It was me, but uh, no. Uh, 40 days and 40 nights. I hope we got the, everything closed up here. So here's Paul, this Mediterranean disease, believed that his eyes would ooze this 
you know, substance. And he was, had been beaten up and whipped and chained, and, and yet his soul was prospering. So you can either be prospering and in good health and your soul's prospering, or you may not be prospering. You may be unhealthy, but you can prosper spiritually. And then in verse 3 and 4, he talks about his joy that he had for uh, this man Gaius. He says in verse 3, For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came to wherever John was, and they testified or shared with him of the truth that is in you. Again, another mention of that word truth, just as you walk in truth. Now, to walk in truth, what does that mean, to walk in truth? What do you think it means for you, put your name there, for, say, Bo, oh, by the way, can we congratulate this brand new married couple, Bo and Adelaide, would you guys, come on now. They just got married last Saturday. A wonderful couple. Bo is uh, relatively new to our body uh, over a number of years now, a fine young man. And Adelaide, I've actually known her while she was still in her mother's womb because she's been, been here her entire life. So, Bo you better take good care of her or we're all going to come pay you a wedding visit. But uh, no, but seriously, we're happy for the both of you and proud of you guys. But what does it mean to walk in truth? To walk in truth means to believe the word of God, first of all. You can't walk in something that you don't know and believe in. And it means to gladly obey the Lord's instruction. To believe the truth and to gladly obey the Lord's instruction, how do you do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. To believe God and to happily obey Him, asking the Holy Spirit to help you. This kind of life, when you walk in the truth, it brings great joy both to us and to those who follow after and learn from our example. Aren't you impressed and encouraged by people who are walking in the truth? I am. I know people in this congregation. I don't want to embarrass them, but uh, I'm always, you know, I, I, I'll say, how are you doing? And they respond to me in some way, and I can tell it's real, and it just kind of brings me back to reality for a moment. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so people came to, to John and told him what was going on with Gaius, and he said, I rejoiced greatly. I was so thrilled. And then in verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So his greatest joy was to hear that people were believing God, gladly obeying him, depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this was the thing that at this point in John's life, he had a lot of joys in his life. He's now late in life, 90, super duper mature in Christ. The, the, the one apostle is mentioned who didn't, wasn't martyred. And he says, you know, I, the thing that gives me the greatest joy at this point in my life, it's to know that my children referring to those who perhaps came to Christ under his ministry there in Ephesus are walking in the truth. He had developed over time a clear view of what is truly important in life. I remember Pastor Chuck Smith saying a number of years before he died and he was approaching his 80s, might have even, well, he was not quite 80, but he said, you know, I, I'm at a point in my life now where I have quite a perspective. I see things a lot differently. And that's what happened to John. And for you and I, the things most of us focus our attention on have to do with scrambling to advance in our careers, working out misunderstandings and problems in life, in relationships. Those are all important things. But those things had receded in significance to this 
man John. What was it that thrilled him now? He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. And you and I need to take that same attitude when it comes to our own physical children. One author said this, he said, I'm glad for mom or dad who tells with obvious pride about the great joy that their son is having in terms of his new job, his promotion, or the house that he just purchased with a swimming pool for such and such an amount of money and saved all this money and, you know, instead of the full price and so on. But we need to remember that the one truly important thing in life is that our children walk in truth and walk with God. That's the most important thing for those of you who are parents. And I was sharing with Pastor Mike the other day in our congregation here on Wednesday and today at first service, in reading through the one-year Bible this last week, a part of it had to do with a cultural issue that was really tragic, and that was that in Jesus' day, uh, women and children were not valued as they are today. They were really dismissed as being just kind of an annoyance. And so the crowds, of course, which included women and children, were trying to get to Jesus, and little children out of natural curiosity would want to see what's going on, and the disciples were shooing them away. And Jesus said, wait a minute. He said, you allow those little children to come to me. And he took one of them, and he put him on his lap, and he used him as, a, as an object lesson. He said, of such is the kingdom of God, little children. Now, uh, I'm not sure exactly all that he meant by that, but he did say, in order to come into the kingdom of God, you have to become like a little child, a simple faith to come into the kingdom of God. And then a few verses later, he said something very alarming, which reveals the heart of God towards children and towards people who would harm them. And it leads me to something I want to talk with you about for just a couple of minutes, in a minute. He said, if anyone harms these little children, they're going to be executed and they're going to suffer. And he said, let me tell you, it would be better for them to be executed by having a millstone tied around their neck than what I'm going to do to them. A millstone was a large circular rock, like a big, thick silver dollar, only real thick, with a hole in the middle, and they would roll it around to crush the grain. And what they would do as a form of execution is take ropes and chains and put it through that hole and wrap your body around it and put it on the edge of a cliff into the ocean or just a rocky cavern, you know, a, a rocky valley, and they would throw you off. Can you imagine the horror in your mind of your, that rock's going down faster than you are? It's pulling you down like a lead balloon kind of thing. So when I was reading that, I thought, boy, the Lord really doesn't want, he values these little children, and he doesn't want anybody to hurt them. And I was thinking then of the children that exist today in our society and what they are facing, which you and I as adults didn't face when we were little children. The world is a very dangerous and growing by the minute evil place to live in. And so we as a church want to be able to build on the current children's ministry that we have as we're in a rebuilding process by providing a ministry that is not only meaningful and enjoyable and Christ-centered Bible teaching to our children, but also provides content for the parents to be able to minister to their kids. Uh, my children now at their adult age tell me, Dad, I now understand why you wanted us to read the Bible every morning. I mean, they're, they're, you know, thank you, 48 years old. You know, I'm <laughs> good, good to hear you say that, but, um, but they're getting it. But, you know, the, the program that we're, we're talking about, and Pastor Mike is going to go up and, with a team and look at it, it's a program that has 
a connection between Sunday morning and Wednesday night. So they're not two different things. There's some continuity between it. And we're looking at ministering to the children, and not that we've, and it's odd, you know, we, we minister to 300 children a week outside of our church. And we don't even have close to that amount in our church, not even close. But we anticipate that they're going to be coming. And so we're going to start with whatever we've got in anticipation of the Lord bringing them and believing that God is speaking to us in our hearts about the needs those children have, and we want to minister to them and minister to their parents. So Pastor Mike is going to go look at a, a ministry that we formerly have had and revisit it called the Calvary Kids Club, and it's a beautiful little ministry. And we're going to begin by bathing that in prayer. And we know that prayer is at the foundation of the Lord directing us, modifying our thoughts, closing doors, opening doors. So we're very, very, very enthused about what God is going to do here. And I just want to pass that on to you and encourage you to be... And, and of course, if you're a parent... You know, it doesn't matter what your child does for a living. What makes you the happiest is what? If they're walking with Christ. That's really the main thing, you know. You want them to do well in every way, but if they're walking with the Lord, that's what counts. And so now in verse 5, what happens is John begins to really identify the, the ministry that this man Gaius had, and it was his generous treatment of traveling ministers. And let me give you a little bit of cultural background again. You know, today, when a traveling minister comes here, he, he or she comes here usually at our invitation or at their request. And we plan it out, we know them, etc. And we don't just, we occasionally have people who call us who we don't know and they say, hey, can we come and have a minute? You know, and we think about it, but usually it's people we know. Back then, genuine ministers of God would just travel freely, unannounced. There was no cell phone texting, no phone calls, no computers, no advance warning of anything. People would just go from little town to little town. They'd show up and say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so, and I'm a, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and so what Gaius did uh, was he really got behind helping these people. He was so generous. And so Paul, uh, John is commending him. He says in verse 5, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and especially for strangers. He said, I want to commend you. You are so faithful in what you're doing for these people. And these people have borne witness of your love to the church. They have testified to the body all around. Hey, this man Gaius has been so wonderful in supporting us. And then he defines it a little more. He said, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well. He said, um, that's one of the things he was doing. He was helping them to move forward on their journey. He would help them when they arrived with food. He would no doubt give them food for the journey. He would give them money. He would make arrangements perhaps for hospitality companions or people to go with them a little bit or maybe arrange means of travel for these people. And then he says in verse 7, because they went forth for his namesake. Now, not everybody in ministry goes forth for his namesake but these people did. They weren't in it to promote themselves. They were going forth, leaving behind a career, leaving behind what you and I might call a normal life. And not everybody is called to this, but they were. And they went forth, and they did it for his name's sake. They were representatives of Jesus Christ. They were serving the Lord. And you'll notice in the last part of verse 7, taking nothing from the Gentiles, the unsaved people. In other words, they, they were only supported by churches and individuals. And when they would go to a new area to minister, they would not take money. Paul himself in 1 Thessalonians chapter 
2 said, you know how we labored night and day when we were there. We didn't take anything from you um, because what also happened is fake in it for the money ministers, fake news ministers would go from town to town. I'm sorry. They would go from town to town. I just fake, you know, it's current lingo. We're not going there, okay? Unless you want to, but no, we're not going there. But they would go and they'd say, hey, I'm so-and-so. and It's all great. But they were really in it for the money. They were scammers, scam artists. And so what would happen is they gave a bad name to the Christian gospel, which was just beginning like molasses to spread. And so what these people would do is they would be supported by believers, and when they went somewhere, they would specifically not take money. They would serve the people, love the people at their own expense so as to gain their trust. Hey, we're not here to take from you. We are here to give to you. And without embarrassing anybody here, when we have teams that go places, the majority of the time, those team members pay for their own expenses to go. Sometimes we supplement that, but they take their own money to go somewhere. And when they go like to Belize or uh, different locations, they don't go to ask for money, they go to give. When we go to pastor's conferences and teach at pastor's conferences, we don't receive any money. When I used to go to Japan a lot, I can tell you I got trapped into something in my mind. You go to Japan, they, they not only want to give you financial gifts, they want to give you like tons of money. They're just, they're extremely generous. And I'd been there a few times, and I thought, man, these you know, gosh, they're just, they just give you all this money. I thought, I, I like going to Japan. <laughs> and I can remember a couple times I thought, I'm going to figure out how I can go to Japan a couple times this year. <laughs> I really did. And I was now caught in this what's in it for me thing. And so he's saying, look, they went forth for the Lord taking nothing from the Gentiles. They, they aren't supported by uh, pagans. And if you'll bear, bear with me in my folly for a moment, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, recently we were accused of that the church was paying for all of our legal expenses in this matter that is now over. Well, that was true in one regard, but what was not mentioned is that my wife and I have taken every penny we've had in our retirement account, and we've put most of that back into the church to pay for those expenses. Plus, Gail and I, well, plus Gail and I, uh, five, six, seven years ago, took a 60% pay cut in retirement benefits, everything. So we wouldn't have to lay people off here in the church. And we did it joyfully. In fact, the board, it's one of the only times the board said no, and I said no. It's my decision. I can, it's my money. I can do what I want. So there, no. Because <laughs> uh, we get along real well as a board. And, but, but one of the things that also has happened to us, even though we're giving this money, we kind of stopped tithing even though we were giving far more than a tithe. And we recently have begun tithing again. And what a joy it is to do that. It's, it's a real joy. To, it's, a, it's an absolute joy. It's an act of worship. And, and I'm just being, you know, very transparent with you and right from the scriptures here and encouraging you, uh, we, are, we are supporting Victor Marx once a month for $100. He's in Mosul, Iraq, right now on the news where the ISIS has been using chemical weapons against those people. He's right there in that area of western Iraq. His life is on the line. And then Tom Price, who who was with, is with the Calvary Chapel magazine. 
Um, and by the way, there's a free copy of this out for you in the, right in the lobby. Uh, it's Reaching the World for Christ. He's the editor of this magazine, a good friend of mine, and we've known each other for years. Um, and in fact, a little story about him many years ago, before he even started this, when we were in Hungary, where they don't give you money when you preach, <laughs> didn't ask to go back there. No, I did. <laughs> Uh, we ran into a young lady named Olgi who wanted to go to the Calvary Chapel Bible School and she couldn't quite afford it and somehow we found out about it and our church helped support her to go through that Bible School. And then Tom, as he was out beginning the Calvary Chapel magazine, he ran into Olgi and fell in love with her and they got married. And she now works with him and, and is his helper. So I texted him the other day and I said, I'm not sure what your protocol is for receiving personal financial support, but Gail and I would like to send you $100 a month. And he said, oh, that, that would be great and would appreciate it. And he said, as a matter of fact, he said, uh, I haven't been able to take a raise since 2008. And I thought, wow. And that may be your case too. But what a humble guy. And then um, I took the initiative to ask our accounting department to also send $100 a month to um, Victor and $100 a month to Tom, and then our board uh, will ratify that here in the next month or so. But that's what John was talking about, about supporting these people. And this magazine, it occurred to me through Tom's visit here, and not because he was pushing this magazine, but it's a window to the world of missions within our Calvary Chapel family. In fact, their next issue in April, May, uh, we will be on the front of this. And they're doing two parts. One is the Rejoice in Reconciliation Matter that has, has occurred, and two, an article on our church. And so this magazine will go all around the world, and I'm finally going to be famous <laughs> instead of infamous, which I've been for a long time. In verse 8, he says, We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. He's saying, Gaius, we ought to receive these missionaries so we can become, notice, fellow workers for the church. One of the things I want to pray about, just mentioned at first service, Mike doesn't know this, our board doesn't know it, and we're not going to do it till we get approval from the board, is this. I would like to take the largest Wednesday night offering of each month, which is usually either the last offering of the month on Wednesday or the first Wednesday of the month. It's usually the largest of all the Wednesdays. And make that a missionary offering. And I don't want that to keep you from personally supporting people, but we'd like to take that money and divvy it up and send it out to the missionaries that we support. They need help. They're, and, and it's you know, they are happy to be out there, but they need love. They need support. He's saying here, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. And we would like to take what, that, what the Lord said in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, try me now in this and see if I won't open the windows of heaven for you and pour out such a blessing on you that there isn't enough room to receive it. Do you know there was a point in the Old Testament when David was building the temple and they'd been receiving offerings and finally the guys that received the offerings to build the temple came and said, David, they're giving too much money. That can happen in a church. It's happened in our church where there's been an abundance of it. But what a wonderful era of rebuilding that we're in. Well, now in verse 9, uh, John deals with this troublemaker. And there are troublemakers in every church. He said, I wrote to the church, probably the Ephesian church, but Diotrephes, and nothing much is known of him other than what is said here. He could have been the pastor. I don't think he was. But he was a person in the church. But here's what's said of him. He loves to have the preeminence among them. 
and he does not receive us. So you have to stop and think. Here's the Apostle John writing to the church, and we don't know what the content was, but it implied here is that he wanted to come. And this Diotrephes, who likes to be the big shot, wouldn't receive us. Wouldn't receive the Apostle John? Verse 10, John tells us about his selfish activities and what he was going to do once he arrived there if he did. He says, therefore, if I come, here's what I'm going to do. I will call to mind his deeds. In other words, I'm going to bring up in public what this, or you know, in whatever meeting needs to be, I will call to mind his deeds which he does. I'm going to deal with it straight on. And that's how a troublemaker should be dealt with, with prayer and just straightforwardly in love, not to, not to punish, not to hurt, but to restore and to do it in love and to do it clearly. His deeds which he does, prating, and the word prating there means talking nonsense. He's just full of nonsense. He's prating against us with malicious words, words designed to hurt and not only that, and not content with that, as if that was enough, he himself does not receive the brethren. It's the second thing. And thirdly, he forbids those who wish to. There were others in the church who said, oh yeah, can, can John come? No. And then he puts those people out of the church. He excommunicated the people who wanted to help John and visiting ministers. And then... John says in verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. <laughs> Don't follow that guy's example. But what is good? Follow Gaius' example. He who does good is of God. He who does evil has not seen God. You know, we become what we focus on the most. If we constantly concentrate on negative things we will likewise become pessimistic and destructive. If we focus on sinful things, we will give the enemy a stronghold and we will stumble in our faith. That is why God wants us to seek him, express our love for him, and have intimate fellowship with him. That is the way our character is transformed into his likeness, and that is life at its very best. The third gentleman he talks about is Demetrius in verse 12. Not a lot said about him, but it was a mouthful. He says he has a good testimony. He's got a good reputation. That's a lot. I always tell my wife, I said, honey, when you speak at my funeral, if I happen to go before you, which I hope would be the case, selfishly, because whenever I'm gone for a period of time, she doesn't seem to have any trouble. You know, and when I get home, she says, uh, how are you? And I said, fine. And how are you? So doing just fine, thanks. <laughs> what can I help you with? So, you know, she's pretty self-sufficient. I'm the needy one, for goodness sakes. But I've always said to her, honey, would you just say, if you would just say he was a decent man, that, I think that'd be okay. She said, oh, oh no. She says, I have a lot. I'm going to say about you. That's what worries me. So maybe she'll be sick that day. But Demetrius had a good, good testimony from all, everybody that spoke. Demetrius, oh yeah, good guy, good guy. And from the truth itself, measuring him to the truth. And we also bear witness, and, and you know that our testimony is true. So Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. And then he just concludes the letter by stating there in the last couple of verses, I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to our friends. Greet you and greet the family by face. Peace to our friends. So, what would you say about yourself? What might be said on your tombstone, your epitaph? 
What would others say about you? Have you ever read one of those books of humorous epitaphs? Like the one in England that tells it all? Here it is. Mary Pickett lies silent and fast. Her husband's ears have peace at last. <laughs> or from the old cowboy days, Flicker the horse was quicker. Actually, the thing about even humorous epitaphs is that most do say something about the character of the person they memorialize. Something stands out, something that folks remember. In a sense, John suggested a theme for the epitaphs of two leading individuals in that first century Christian community there in Asia. One, Diotrephes, who was marked off as loving first place. He gossiped, trying to make others look small so he'd look bigger by comparison. And he tried to dominate his little group by cutting off any contact they may have with others. Someone might have written something like this on his tombstone. Diotrephes, who cut down others, things are better now he's not around. The great English preacher Charles Spurgeon said, a man who will not do well in his present place because he longs to be higher is already too high and should be put lower. The self-seeking and self-important diatrophies heads a long line of people who never learned to distinguish between love for Christ and love for their place in the church. Dr. David Jeremiah said, John writes stringing, stinging words about this leader within the church because he posed a serious danger. He was power hungry and prideful. He aggressively opposed the truth and those who were preaching it. He worked hard to keep out anyone who might threaten his position, which was the problem with the Pharisees. Then he used his influence to promote selfishness in others. Today we find such an attitude manifested in churches that become a cult personality. Those with diatrophies disease want to be first. They greedily seek prominence and control. Yet only one person can have preeminence among God's people, Jesus Christ. Our focus as believers should not be our position within the church, but rather our participation in the work of the church to advance God's kingdom and bring him glory. We serve God best when we generously employ the resources and talents he has given us to serve his people. And the truth be told, it's hard to grow as a Christian and deal with these pride issues. Pride is hated by God. It was Satan's sin. That's why the Bible says don't put a novice into a position of authority lest he be lifted up with the sin of pride like Satan. God has to whittle you down. And he deals with that. And you can see it in younger pastors. They don't even realize it. We don't even realize it when we're young. But God is faithful because, you see, he loves us even in our pridefulness and he wants to work with us and make us more useful for him. On the other hand, back to this passage, we have Demetrius who was well spoken of by everyone apparently because he was dedicated to doing good. I suspect a very different epitaph would have marked his memory. Here's something you might try. You might try writing by your own hand, creating an epitaph for Demetrius, just a little two or three line thing. But it's more important to create an epitaph for yourself, but by how you live, not with words. How do you want other people to remember you? 
Here's a quotable epitaph that'll only mean something to some of you who are a little more familiar with the Bible. In heart, a Lydia, and in tongue, a Hannah. In zeal, a Ruth. In wedlock, a Susanna. Probably Charles Wesley's Susanna. 13, 16 kids. Prudently simple, providentially wary. To the world, a Martha, and to heaven, Mary. The epitaph of Dame Dorothy Selby. And lastly, before the announcements are made this morning, I wanted to extend an invitation to you. Last week, I said, you never know, a plane can crash right into a house. A few days later, a twin-engine Cessna 310 crashed into a home in San Bernardino. Five people, four or five people were killed. One person escaped. I think it was four people killed, one escaped. How hard her life's going to be. If you're not a believer, today, the Bible says, is the day for you to repent and to be saved. You see, you're headed on your way to eternal judgment. That's what the Bible says. It is appointed for man to, to die once, and then comes the judgment. You'll face God whether you like it or not. God doesn't want you to st stand before him at the judgment seat, at the judgment, the great white throne judgment. He wants you to be saved. You can't be saved after you die. You can't say, wait a minute, I, <laughs> I need to rethink this. It's now. And the, the, the false sense of security that we have about, well, yeah, later, especially young people. There's so many things I want to do. I, I, you know, a Christian life, man, you got to give this up and give that up. Well, you wait till you do if you get to do all the things that you think are so much fun and you're going to find out they're not. Sin is pleasurable only for a season. And then you will find yourself more empty than you knew empty could be. But the biggest problem you have is sin. It's cut you off from God. Jesus Christ is the bridge. You have to walk to him to get saved. And you can do that just while I'm talking to you. You can say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. You were buried. You rose from the dead. And I'm asking you to save me today. I'm asking you to come into my life. And you know what? Jesus said, whoever, and one of the things that keeps people from coming to Christ along with pride is guilt. You may be thinking, I've been so bad, God certainly couldn't save me. You're wrong. His death was for every sin. I don't care how bad yours was or is. You come to Jesus today. With that said, let's have the announcements. Uh, Mike, I'm not sure who's doing the announcements this morning. That would be Justin, who leads our college ministry. Could we welcome... Justin Milinich, please.